Hello, today we're going to talk about the soul part two, and today we're going to be all up in our feelings. We're going to be talking about the passions, what those are, how they work, what is the universal motivation behind all of them, and just generally kind of how it all fits together in our discussion of the soul. So stay tuned. Welcome to To Mystic Womanhood. Today is part two of the soul, and we're going to continue talking on the passions and uh, basically the appetite of powers. So go in Casey and I stand a little bit right now, and we're gonna have like a written diagram. This is my visual aid. And as we can see here, we talked about in the last video, the more apprehensive, they're called apprehensive powers. Not apprehensive in the sense of like you're nervous, but they're apprehensive in the sense of kind of like police, when the police apprehends a criminal, they grab that guy, right? Well, apprehensive powers are, we're grabbing the stimulation from the outside world, the stimuli from the outside world, we're grabbing it and kind of taking it in and using it as like raw material to form decisions and judgments and opinions on. So that's how that works. So that is what we talked about in the last video. In today's video, we're going to go into the appetitive powers. And what this means is basically we're going to look at the appetites of the soul. We're familiar with the appetite of the body, which, you know, oh, I like to eat, you know? Basically think of an appetite as like a desire for something. It's an inclination towards something. And our, our soul has inclinations toward things. You know, everybody, and we see this, you know, it's universal. People have inclinations towards stuff. You know, we tend to get mad over the same things. We tend to get sad over the same things. You know, in general, looking at the human condition as a whole, we tend to have these inclinations toward things. And that is what an appetite is. And so we have two main appetites. And under those appetites, each one has an array of passions. Now you can think of a passion as an emotion. It's a feeling, you know, this is our feelings. This is why I said we're gonna be all up in our feelings because that is what these appetites consist of. So the first appetite, and in this thing here, we have the irascible appetites and then we have the concupiscible appetites. And I probably should have flip-flopped this order because the irrational or the irascible one, haha, <laughs> it, it is irrational sometimes. The irascible one, is actually a little more spiritual and the concupiscible one is a little closer to the physical side. If you watch my other video, I had said that with our soul, our soul and our body are very tightly intertwined and this is where everything is strictly spiritual and this is where it is strictly physical. And then this in here is the gray area where the spiritual and the physical are coming together. And it's, you know, it's hard for us to tell what's really we're driving things in this middle zone. It can be affected by our soul, you know, and what we think of things, like what our opinion is. You know, modern psychology tells us this. I am upset because I think you don't love me, you know? And that can be, you know, that can cause us to be upset. That's where our soul is making a judgment. Our intellect's making a judgment. And then we're feeling feelings in response to that. But on the other hand, our body can cause us to feel feelings too. Have you ever felt sad and then all of a sudden you took a nap and you felt better. That can be because our body is influencing us. As women, you know, we're well aware every month our feelings will get a little out of control because of our body, you know, because of our physical hormones. And, you know, modern science hasn't, we don't fully know which parts of the body are controlling, like which parts of the soul. Like, we don't really know that maybe just yet. I don't know if we'll ever know that. But, but basically, so that's how that works. So the first one we'll get into is the concupiscible appetite. These are, again, an appetite is just an inclination. And concupiscible means this is a more simple good. It's ordered toward a bodily good. Remember how I said, if you watched my truth, what is truth video, I had talked about how our intellect, our mind is inclined to the truth. We want to know the truth. That's our inclination there. You could almost say like our intellect has an appetite for the truth. 
Well, our concupiscible appetite is an appetite for bodily pleasure. So eating, sleeping, sex, things like that, comfort, you know, sitting on a nice comfy chair, having a nice bubble bath. Those are things that we're oriented toward. And it's more physical in the sense that it's more simple. And we're oriented toward either going toward the good or avoiding evil. That is kind of what these feelings are in the concupiscible appetite area. Um, so for the good, if we, you know, if we perceive something good, we can have love, we can have enjoyment, or we can have desire. Desire is the simplest one, you know, I just, I want this thing. I see this, I want it. You know, you're kind of like, what's that saying? I see it, I want it, I buy it. You know, it's just kind of like that desire. Well, we just want that. Enjoyment going up a level here. We have enjoyment is that feeling of, you know, relishing that bodily good. So when you're in a, you know, a nice hot tub, you know, you feel that enjoyment, you know, it's like, ooh, it's a nice, the bubble bath. It's so warm and relaxing, you know, or you have this nice meal and it just tastes amazing. So that's the enjoyment, you know, you're really relishing in it. And then we have one, love, which surprisingly, you would think it would be a little more complex, but we do have love and it's kind of a good order toward a person. And so love, love can be complex. You know, this is a complex one and I'm going to kind of, there's one thing I want to point out about love. We're going to move through most of these passions pretty quickly. One, because a lot of them we're already familiar with, you know, we know it well, anger, I have something to say on anger, but like things like hope, fear, we know what those are. You know, we're not going to go too much into detail with them, but love, there is an important distinction about love that I want to go over. This right here. So this is a book. It's called Introduction to the Science of Mental Health. It's written by Father Chad Ripperger. He's actually an exorcist and Woo, I've listened to his sermons, like he's got quite some stories, but he wrote a book on mental health. And you may think, why would an exorcist do that? Why, why would they care about mental health? It's actually very relevant to that kind of work. When somebody is, comes to you and, and says, oh, I'm possessed. Well, you have to figure out, are they psychologically unhealthy? Are they a little disturbed in the head? Or are they legitimately possessed? You know, um, so a good exorcist needs to have a good grounding in modern psychology as well as the Thomistic. This, this particular exorcist, this priest, he knows a lot about St. Thomas, Aristotle, um, the Thomistic things, the soul, all that. So he's very grounded in Thomistic psychology, which is the official word for it. I talked about it in the other video, but he's very grounded in both Thomistic psychology and also modern psychology. Because, you know, I hope it didn't sound like I was knocking modern psychology too much in my last video, because, you know, it is useful. There's a lot of times where, you know, you need to see a psychologist. But but, you know, he's well-versed in both, and he's written a book on mental health about it. And so, quoting St. Thomas in this book, he is talking about love, and it says, quoting St. Thomas, love is defined as the willing of the good of another. Okay, and there is an article in the Summa where St. Thomas talks about love. Maybe we'll do a video later on about that, simply because as women, you know, love is very important to us and getting it right is crucial. But, but basically, we'll just kind of say that love is willing the good of another. We say a lot of things about love nowadays, you know, I love chocolate cake or I love this, but as we saw with the passion of enjoyment, we know the chocolate cake that's not love. That's really enjoyment. You are enjoying the chocolate cake. But the thing about love is there's actually two kinds of love. And this is what I want us to kind of pay attention to. So the first is when one loves something for one's own sake or for oneself, for yourself, you're loving this person for yourself, or you're loving this person for the sake of the other one. The second form of love and it's another Latin phrase, amor secundum quid, love in a certain respect. But it's basically like the love of that person. It's like the love of friendship. You love them in and of themselves. And this is an important distinction to make with love because it's not just, you know, as women, we need to know when a man says, I love you, we need to know 
what he means by that. And a lot of men, you know, we've often said, oh, does he love me for sex or does he love me for me? So you know, sorry, I'm pointing. I probably shouldn't point, that's rude. You know instinctively that there are these two kinds of love. You know, this is what we women mean when we, we say that to each other. Oh, I don't know if he loves me for me or if he's just trying to get in my pants. Well, a lot of times when men are just trying to get in your pants, it's that first kind of love. They're feeling the passion of love. You know, it's, it's an actual emotion. It is one of the passions of the soul is love, but they are loving for one for themselves. So they're not really loving you for you. They're loving for the good they can get out of you. And we often have that love for God too. You know, we can love God because of the benefits he gives us. You know, men can love us not to be like vulgar, but they can love us for our sexual benefits and not really love us for who we are as people. And we can do that with God. We can love God for the blessings we get from him and not really love him for himself. And that's not good. That's not true love. You know, um, there's a reason all the fairy tales back in the day, you know, if you watch the Disney movies, the Disney movies are themselves built on most, well, not so much recently. When I was in the night, like when I was a kid, Disney was based more on like the original fairy tales. Now it's like, I don't know where they're getting their fairy tales, honestly. I mean, they had some good movies. Moana was pretty cool. But anyways, the love, that's why it was so important. You know, little girls in the fairy tales would be told like, oh, you know, true love will do this. And, you know, the princess in the fairy tale has to discern true love. You know, it's because of this distinction. You know, we can love something just for ourselves. We can love selfishly or we can love more unselfishly. And we can love for the other person. We can truly will their good because it is their good you know, because we want them to be happy, whether or not we're going to get something out of it. So that's, that's a distinction in there that I thought was important to call out while we're talking about love. Because as women, I just wanted to say, like, when you're sitting there kind of trying to discern these two ways a guy loves you, yeah, you're philosophically accurate. There really are two ways men can love us. And there are two ways we can love men, you know, there are women that just use men for their money. And again, it's the same thing. They're not loving this man in and of himself. They're loving for the benefit they can get out of him. And we all have to be careful of that. It's very easy to do. You know, we can often love a man because we don't want to be lonely. You know, and we don't necessarily love him for himself. We're just kind of clinging to him because we don't want to be alone. And so it's something we all do. It's something we all struggle with. You know, like I said, we even do it with God. And it's something we have to just work to overcome. We have to try and love in an unselfish way. But anyways, big tangent on love. We'll go back to the, the passions here, the rest of them. So moving on, the concupiscible appetites, as I was saying, for good are love, enjoyment, and desire. For evil, if our concupiscible appetite, if we see an evil, something we, that we not good or could threaten good, we have either hate, sorrow or aversion. Um, so hate, I'm not talking like hate speech. I'm just talking like, I don't like this. You know, love or desire is, ooh, I want this. Hate is, oh, it's not necessarily want to push it away. That's aversion. You know, it's kind of like flight. You want to just get away from it. But hate is, it's the opposite. Well, yeah, it's the opposite of love. You know, you in love, you recognize a good, something that you want that is good and beneficial. With hate, you recognize the lack of a good. You recognize a good that maybe should be there, but isn't. And because it's not there, you don't like that. That can be like, you know, like a, a man cheats on you. You can feel a certain hate for him because you're like, you were supposed to love me. That good of love and fidelity was not there. And so now there's a hatred because you perceive that lack of a good. That really is all evil is in a, in a certain sense. A certain sense, evil can be thought of as like a lack of a good. Something that was supposed to be there and be good is missing. And so in, in a way, it's, that's evil. That's not the official definition of evil. I think there's some nuances I'm leaving out, but that is it. So that's concupiscible appetite. Now we're moving on to the irascible appetite here. So right here on these. And again, 
This is actually a more spiritual one than the concupiscible appetites. The feelings under the heading of the concupiscible, they're a little more simple. The irascible appetite, they're not as simple feelings. They're a little more complex. That's why if you're in like a therapy session and you're trying to unpack anger or unpack hope or something, it's a little harder to unpack than just love because love just, it just happens. It's more simple. But, you know, anger and fear, well, you got to kind of unpack it a little bit because these are the ones that are more involved with our intellect. We have to make a perception, a judgment call on whether we think it's good or not before we can even begin to feel these feelings. And again, this all happens in a split second. You know, we, we don't even realize this is happening. And it probably sounds complicated that I'm even discussing it, like breaking it down like this. But, but it, it all happens instantaneously. But there is, you know, an additional step with the irascible appetites, with these irascible feelings. So with hope, we, the irascible, so the concupiscible is simple. It's just ordered toward a good, it just wants something good. Whereas the irascible is ordered toward the difficult good. See, there's a little distinction there. And that's why you have to involve your intellect before you can even discern whether it's difficult or not. And so with the irascible appetite, it is more, uh, so if it's something good, if it's a difficult good, you're going to have two feelings. You're going to have either hope, you know, if you think you can attain it, or you're going to have despair if you know it's impossible to attain it. Hope, you know, when you first meet that guy and you're like, yeah, we're dating, like, I hope this works out. You know, you see this good and it could be difficult and it's in the future, but you think it, it, you have a good reasonable chance that it's going to work out, you think. So you feel that hope. And then later, if you guys break up, you feel that despair. Now you know this good that you were hoping for is impossible. You're not going to achieve that good. You won't attain that good. It's a difficult good that is going to be impossible to attain, and that is despair. And so that's why the first few days of a breakup, when it really hits you, you know, you don't want to get out of bed. You just, you have no will to live. You're like, I'm just despairing. Like, I will never get what I want and it, it can be so devastating, but it's that recognition of the impossibility of attaining your good. Now, on the other hand, if it's not related to a good, whether you could get it or you're not going to get it, what if it's an evil? You're seeing something and you're like, this is not going to be a good. This is again why breakups are complex. You're having multiple feelings here. But with anger, you know, the ones that are toward evil, let's say you see a difficult, they're ordered toward the difficult good, but if you can't get that difficult good, you're going to feel different feelings. These are going to be the ones on like the evil side. So you have anger, audacity, and fear. Now when I say audacity, I don't mean it in the sense that we typically use this word nowadays. Audacity was a word originally used in Thomistic psychology to mean a kind of boldness. And the word has still kind of maintained some of that connotation. You know, if a guy will do something really rude, you'll be like, how can he have the audacity to do that? You know, and it, it implies boldness. And that is what this word means in the Thomistic psychology way. It is a certain boldness. You are going out. I have some notes on it here somewhere. But basically, you with audacity, what you're doing is you're being aggressive toward an imminent danger because you think you're going to be victorious. So some kind of danger, you know, some threat to the good. You're going to be aggressive toward it because you're pretty confident you're going to achieve what you're doing. You know, it's not like despair. You know, you're like, I'm never going to get, it's impossible. It's the opposite. You're like, I'm going to freaking kick this thing's butt, you know. Now, in a positive sense, this is what we consider courage. You know, you're going out and you're going to go right or wrong, you know, and you think you can do that. So you're going to go do that. On the negative side, this can kind of be that like boldness you get if you had too much to drink and then suddenly the dance floor starts looking really good and like you're normally really shy and introverted, but like you have a couple beers and suddenly you're like, I'm Beyonce. I'm going to like show you guys my moves. And then like you wake up the next day and you're like mortified and you're like, what was I thinking? That's, that's audacity. You were feeling the feeling of audacity. You were going to go out to that danger of not dancing 
and you are going to be victorious over that and you are going to right that wrong of you not dancing so that's kind of a funny story but that's what it means so then the next one is anger anger is part of the irascible appetite but it's kind of it's known as what's called a complex passion because with anger you're actually feeling two passions at once there is the sorrow the recognition of a loss of good you know we can that's part of the concupiscible appetite sorrow strictly speaking is loss it's sadness but then with anger it's like you feel sorrow but you're taking it one step over and you're like well this should not have been you know like this was wrong and i'm gonna write that wrong you know it can be with audacity you're right and wrong and you don't necessarily feel like sorrow about it you know it's just you know it is what it is but with anger you're right and wrong in the context of a good that you didn't get, that you feel you should have gotten. And that's why anger is called a complex emotion, because it's both that desire for that like vindication, that like revenge, and it's sorrow at the same time. But so as an example, this is often present in like traumas. And this is what psychologists will mean when they're like, you got to let the anger go. And the reason they're saying that is from a Thomistic psychology point of view, it's because these two uh, passions are intertwined. The anger will not allow you to move past the sorrow because it's a complex passion. They're together. So you have to let go of that desire for that vindication, you know, righting that wrong. Well, my mother was hard on me growing up and yet she will not apologize. I, I just can't move on until she apologizes and we write that wrong. Well, you know, maybe she's never going to apologize and you're never going to get that wrong righted, which means you're never going to be able to let go of the sorrow there as well. So that's that's kind of what psychologists mean when they're like, you, you got to let go of the anger and forgive. You know, people can be like, well, I'm not going to forgive, you know, that's how. But they don't mean forgive in the sense of just like let that person in and be terrible. What they often mean is you have to let go of that anger the Thomistic psychological anger, you know, the desire for that revenge or that desire to right that wrong so that that loss can be addressed. And yeah, because they're, they're intertwined, they're together, two things together. If you don't let go of that vindication, that desire for righting that wrong, you're never going to heal from that sorrow, really. They'll always be stuck together in, in your soul. But anyways, that's kind of how that works. And then fear. The last one is fear. You know, we know this, this is a little different than like aversion or flight, you know, flight and aversion is it's right there. And, uh, you don't like that. Fear is where you're kind of projecting into the future. Again, this is why it's a more spiritual, so to speak, emotion, because you're, you're having to use your intellect to kind of project into the future and go, you know, based on my intellect and what I know, this is not going to go well. And I'm afraid of that. I, oh, I, there is an evil that is going to come, you know, and I, I feel afraid. That's what that is. So that's pretty much how that works. And then moving up to, let's see, I'm looking at my notes here, just making sure that we covered everything. Yeah, that's pretty much how that works. And before we move on from the passions or emotions, one thing that I want to say about this is all emotions are rooted in some kind of love in the sense of some kind of attachment and desire for something because you know if you think about it why do you hate something well because there was a good that was lacking you know why are you sorrowful there was a loss of a good and in both cases you were you loved that good that you didn't get and that is why all of these all of our emotions are rooted in some kind of love, some kind of attachment. And that is often why like Buddhists will say like, you know, they'll say basically like attachment is the source of all suffering. And so you should just try to snuff out your feelings and, you know, become detached from everything, you know, just try not to have any kind of feelings that could attach you to anything. And you just kind of numb yourself out, which is not healthy. Sorry. But because, on the other hand, while we're all familiar, all these emotions here, we're familiar with the bad effects, but at the same time, 
if you didn't have any emotions or passions, you know, is the, is the philosophical term for it, the Thomistic psychology term, if you didn't have any passions, life, you would not be able to do anything. Passions are kind of like the engine that drive us down the little paths of life. Think of them as like the horses in the chariot. They have to be controlled, you know, your mind, your intellect has to control your passions so that you can kind of guide them where you want them to go. But, you know, they are what pull the chariot, you know. If you want to pursue a career, or you want to start a family, or you want to travel somewhere, you need passions to do that. You know, you need to feel like doing it. This is why, you know, this is why depression can be so harmful to people's lives because when you're depressed, you know, you don't really feel much of anything, you know, you're just very apathetic. And then, you know, a lot of things that need to get done in life, uh, you just don't do it because you just don't feel like it, you know. And that's what happens when, you know, for, uh, you know, it can be due to brain chemistry or it can be due to lifestyle. You know, maybe you're stuck in a lifestyle that is just very negative and unhappy and you're getting kind of depressed because of it but basically when you're depressed you don't you don't have much feeling and so if you've ever thought like oh it'd be nice to not have feelings well it's kind of sort of sort of what happens when you have depression and that's why it is important to have some feeling and why that buddhist philosophy of trying to get rid of all detachment that actually isn't that doesn't work you know so but anyways, that is how uh, that works. And then the next step up. So now that we've kind of talked about our passions, this is kind of the integration between the body and the soul. And then we move up to the strictly spiritual on the will. And when I say the will, I don't necessarily mean like a guy will. I mean it more like I will do this thing or, you know, will you get me that uh, will you get me that camera or whatever? It is will. You are referencing that person's decision-making ability. That is what that is. And so when we will, just as our intellect, our mind is ordered toward the good and the truth. No, I'm sorry. I'm saying that wrong. Our mind is ordered toward the truth, but our will is ordered toward the good. And so when we're choosing, what we're trying to do is we're trying to choose the good. And interestingly enough, human beings, the way our intellect and our soul and everything is wired up, we cannot choose evil as such. We can only choose it under the aspect of good. So, and that's something that kind of blew my mind. I went to a very Thomistic college. Um, it was a private school and we studied Latin, the Summa, theology, philosophy, all this stuff. And I remember when my professor first told me this, um, I raised my hand and I was like, well, explain, like, explain Hitler, you know, explain these like serial killers. Like, of course, human beings choose evil. And he was like, no, if you think about it, they weren't choosing evil. They were choosing something that in their warped intellect, they thought was good. To them, it was good. You know, to Hitler, he came up with all these reasons why getting rid of the Jews was a good idea, you know, or serial killers, you know, or rapists. Here's a one. Rapist will come up, well, she deserved it. She was asking for it. You know, it's not, oh, I'm a terrible human being. It's, oh, well, you know, um, I was just, you know, she wanted me to, you know, they, they have to rationalize it and make it be good. And people think, oh, they're just saying that to impress other people, to influence other people's judgment. And no, that's actually part of how human beings are wired. You know, this is how temptation works. You know, um, when you have like the devil and he's trying to tempt us to sin, this is how it works. He can't come to us and tell us, oh, you should really cheat on your wife you know what, you're going to get divorced, you're going to lose your house, oh my gosh, you're going to like pay child support for the next 10 years, totally ruin your finances, but you should totally cheat on your wife. That's a great idea. No, he's not going to say that because as human beings, we'll see the evil of it and we don't choose evil. That's not how we are. No, he's not going to say that. He's going to say, look at how beautiful your secretary looks. You know, I bet she'd be, she just would feel great. She's just, oh, look at, oh, look at the way she smiled. Look at the twinkle in her eye. Like, that's how you get people to sin. 
So that's kind of how that works, you know. And again, another example, if you're trying, you know, if you're thinking like, oh, should I say that juicy bit of gossip that's probably going to ruin this girl's reputation because I'm not really sure it happened, but I'm pretty sure it happened. Rash judgment. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the video on truth? Yeah. So, but let's say you're thinking about this. You kind of made a rash judgment and you think this girl might be sleeping around, but you're not really sure, but you're like, oh, you know, the devil's not going to tempt you to do it and be like, oh, if you say this, all your friends are going to think that you're a spiteful, jealous brat. No, uh-uh. What he's going to tell you, he's going to tell you, oh, if you tell your friends this, you're going to look like the one in the know. You're going to be the one that figured it out before everybody else. You know, see the difference there? You see how one is just evil. And you're not going to pick that. Oh, I'm going to look like an idiot. All my friends are going to think I'm like this jealous brat. Like, oh, no, no, no. No, he's not going to say that. He's going to tell you the good part of it, you know? And so this is how, uh, this is how our will works, our ability to choose. And this is why being in touch with reality is so important. Because if you are wrong in your assessment and you think something's good when it's actually evil you will choose that thing and then you'll experience all these terrible consequences and you're like i that's not what i wanted you know especially you know like us women if we get into a relationship with a guy who's like a complete jerk you know and all our friends are like why like here's one abusive relationships let's say your boyfriend hits you and people are like why on earth are you staying in this relationship? You're such an idiot. And there can be a lot of shame there because you're like, why am I? Like, what's wrong with me? It's because there's some aspect of good, however small, there's something good about that relationship. So that good is, you know, avoiding breaking up with him. You know, you don't have to go through that heartbreak. You know, maybe you've been through it before and you're like, oh, I just don't want to go through that again. You're choosing the good of avoiding that heartbreak versus, you know, the evil of like him abusing you. And so that's, that's how human beings work. You know, this is the way we make our choices. We pick the good, we aim for the good, and then, you know, we will, the, the consequences will come and hopefully your choice is a more complete good, you know, you're picking something that is more fully good rather than, oh, well, it was just good under this one aspect and I didn't really realize that, oh, it's going to have these other consequences, you know. So that's kind of how that works. But yeah, basically, that is the soul. So I hope that was helpful to you. And the soul, you know, you can get really into detail on it. There's like whole textbooks and things written on it, but I've kind of stayed at a fairly high level and I've tried to keep it pretty practical. And yeah, so I hope that was helpful to you. If you have any questions, leave me a comment. I watch the comments. And so yeah, otherwise like, share, subscribe, you know, do all the things. And uh, I hope you have a great day. See ya.